this race is extremely close, but the media is not telling us this. It's one of my biggest frustrations. And I have no no crystal ball, but I think it's going to be Trump and Bernie. I really do for wow. the general for those two parties. Um, yeah. Because the momentum's with Bernie and the states that are left. I mean, California alone has 475 delegates. And, um, and there's a lot of support for him here in the Democratic Party. There's also um, New York still left to go, Pennsylvania. Um, there's a lot of delegates left out there. And the momentum's with Bernie. And the more you learn about Hillary Clinton's record, the more people are like, oh, my God, she's trouble. And she is. She might literally be indicted by the FBI. Mm. I mean, <laughs> that's trouble. In the 1990s, he created a billion dollar copper producer. In the 2000s, he launched what would become one of the world's top primary silver producers. And in 2015, he started what he believes will be his third billion dollar company. This is the one gold stock to research right now. Visit crushthestreet.com slash invest right. Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I am Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined today with Jen Briney, the host of the Congressional Dish podcast. She is a cut above the average brain, and she sees beyond the facade when it comes to the intricacies regarding government. Her website is CongressionalDish.com. We will have the link under this interview. Uh... Jen, your primary focus is on Congress in general, but today I want to discuss the 2016 election process. So first of all, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show with me today. Thanks so much for having me back. It's always a good time. Jen, a lot of people are using the word rigged to describe <laughs> what we're seeing in this election cycle. Democrats have superdelegates, which up until now have greatly benefited Clinton. And Trump is very unhappy about the way he feels like he's been treated by the establishment Republicans. So I'll start you off with this. Would you agree with the assumption that the process at the moment is rigged? Um... No. And here's why. Because this, the system, as in like the American election system, none of this that's going on in the primaries is part of our American system. Everything that happens in the primaries is party system. So what you're seeing right now are the the private parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, it's how they run their show, you know? Um, they determine the rules for these things. And so if there's people upset about how the primaries are working, it's not the system that's rigged, it's the Democratic and Republican parties. And I think there's a very big difference that's getting lost here. And um, and I understand it, you know, voters go to the, the voting booth and it looks the same and it feels the same, but it's actually quite different. Yeah. So um, I think the part, the problems that we're witnessing, they're Democratic and Republican pro problems, not American problems. Yeah, you know, I, I, I see what you're saying. But at the same time, I mean, growing up in school and, you know, what you see on the media, you know, you I mean, for someone who isn't old enough or I, I don't, you know, have seen other parties kind of come up, you know, these are part of the system to a large degree. They have become part of the system and what we've accepted as the way we elect presidents you know, in our modern day. And it is amazing how Republicans and Democrats have risen and become so powerful that they control the election process to such a large degree. And if you wouldn't mind sharing, I don't know if you've done research on this, but how do the the Democrats and the Republicans select delegates? Because, you know, we're coming up to, for instance, the Republican uh, primary. We're looking at potentially a contested convention. I mean, who are these delegates that are going to be voting and potentially casting their vote elsewhere that isn't a representation of the people? Well, both of the parties really select their candidates at their conventions over the summer. And so as far as the Republicans are concerned, when you go to vote, you're going to vote for delegates, which are then assigned to a candidate at the convention. But if it's too close to call at the convention, that's where inner party workings get into the mix. And when it comes to the Republican side, I don't really know how that works. Um, but it's pretty much like the voters vote for delegates and then things happen at the convention. There can be multiple ballots. And um, if it's not solved on ballot number one, that's where things go haywire. And that's just to show I'm going to wait to see if it happens over the summer. 
On the Democratic side, theirs is actually the more rigged system for the establishment because they have these things called superdelegates. And so basically, the people vote for um, about 85% of the delegates for the Democratic Party, but 15% are determined by party insiders. So that's current members of Cong Congress, former members of Congress, um, former presidents, you know? Right. There's there's one that, that might, you know, pick his wife. Um, so the superdelegates, they have outweighted votes. And um, and so that's where a lot of the anger and confusion on the Democratic side is concerned. And I'm so happy that you you brought that up, because on the Democratic side, you know, our media is doing us a huge disservice by not bothering to understand what's going on in the Democratic system, because those 15 percent, those superdelegates, they don't vote until July. And so there's this idea that Hillary is winning by this huge margin right now. And it is a total lie because back before she was even running, um, she went to these party insiders who are literally her friends and said, hey, do I have your vote? And probably just to shut her up, they said, yeah, you got it, Hill. Mm. And so she's counting those as her own and so is the media, but none of those votes have been cast. So reality, as it is this morning, and I looked this up, Right now, Hillary Clinton is ahead by 251 delegates. Our votes still determine 1,573 delegates, which means that that race is neck and neck. And already people who told Hillary two years ago, sure, whatever, you got my vote. They're already saying, well, if Sanders wins the majority of the, the votes, we're going to vote for him. So there's already people switching. None of those are set in stone. Mm. And so this race is extremely close. But the media is not telling us this it's one of my biggest frustrations do you have any assumption or prediction as to what is going to happen on the democrat and republican side as far as who will win you know what will likely happen at the conventions okay so now i'm just like pontificating you know like just right, guessing speculation. obviously yeah total speculation i have no <laughs> no crystal ball, but I think it's going to be Trump and Bernie. I really do for the wow. general for those two parties, um, yeah. because the momentum's with Bernie in the states that are left. I mean, California alone has 475 delegates, and um, and there's a lot of support for him here in the Democratic Party. There's also um, New York still left to go, Pennsylvania. Um, there's a lot of delegates left out there, and the momentum's with Bernie. And the more you learn about Hillary Clinton's record the more people are like, oh, my God, she's trouble. And she is. She might literally be indicted by the FBI. Mm. I mean, <laughs> that's trouble. And um, I think when I, I comes, just don't know if the establishment's going to allow that, though. I don't think they're going to be able to stop it. And that's what's great, because we still have so many vo votes. And um, they've done all that they can from, you know, getting the corporate media to be misinformed about the, the delegate counts. And still, he just keeps winning. He's watched he's won eight of the last nine contests. So um, at a certain point, unless the Democratic Party really wants their base to disappear and go to the Green Party, they're going to have to allow Bernie Sanders to be their nominee. They're going to have to. They don't have a choice. Hmm. Now, Trump and Sanders claim to be politicians for the people and will not be bought off by big corporations and, you know, won't <laughs> owe favors essentially to these special interests. Now, well, I, what I'll ask you is this. Uh, does it matter whether the president is bought off or not? Or are there other areas of government that have room to benefit special interests regardless of who's at the top in the presidential seat? That is such a good question. Um, I think where it really matters if the president is bought off is in two different areas, and that's in war and trade, because the president is the commander in chief. And so if he's bought off by the military industrial complex, then that's incentives to go and start wars for shady reasons. And that, that has a lot to do with trade, too. You know, we're going and changing regimes all over the world in order to help our corporations keep their, you know, favorable statuses in those countries. And so those two things go hand in hand, which is why fascinating that we're looking towards Trump and Bernie because Trump Trump is a corporation. I mean, go look at the New York skyline. His name is in the middle of it. This guy's got an ego for days. 
but he's not a war corporation. So I don't really know what he would do. And I'm, I'm interested by it. And then Bernie Sanders has never been part of the military industrial complex, which is why they're so afraid of him. So um, as far as like establishment in the hands of corporations are concerned, Hillary Clinton has me more concerned than anybody. Um, Trump and Bernie, you know, Trump, I think is just a wild card. He's right now he's running and he's a professional in pageants. I mean, he was in charge of the Miss America pageant. It was his thing. So he knows how to win. He knows how to say what people want to hear. So I don't think we know what his policies are. But when you look at the money, he's not being paid by Boeing and Raytheon and Northrop Grumman. And, um, you know, it's just a... It's an interesting... <laughs> it's yeah. an interesting way to look at it. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the rules are. I, I know when I look on his website, he does have a donate button. But he does say he doesn't. He's not being paid by major special interests, and he's you know self-funding his campaign. So I don't know what the exact balance is on that, or what he if there's like a maximum he's taking, or uh, or anything like that. But there is a donate button on his website. I do know that. Um, so go, getting back to Hillary real quick, do you think? So you do think that she's going to be indicted? Is there a good chance that this is going to happen? Well, I mean, I don't really know because that's all political, too, because if you if you look at the people in charge of the executive branch and in the judicial branch, those are all Democrats. So it would take someone appointed by President Obama to indict his former secretary of state. So there's a lot of like behind the scenes stuff that could go down that would stop it. But I mean, when I look at what she actually did. She seemed to have broken the law. I mean, she was doing official government business on a system that she set up. It's not like she was just using a Gmail. She had a separate server set up in her in her house and was doing official business on it. And that's, I mean, just bottom line, that does not seem to be legal from what I understand. So, I mean, should there be an investigation? Absolutely. Will there be? I'm not sure. Not with... You know, Loretta Lynch is the attorney general. She was appointed by Obama and Obama and Clinton were political partners during her time as secretary of state. So I, I don't really know. So here in, in the 21st century, Jen, it, is it possible to even run and win as an independent considering the, the topics we just discussed, the Democrat and the Republicans essentially monopolizing the presidential cycles? So it depends on what office you're talking about. When it comes to the presidency, the Democrats and Republicans have really done a fabulous job rigging it in their own favor. And the main reason is that they control the commission on presidential debates now. The debates used to be controlled by the League of Women Voters who tried their hardest. They had some flaws, but they tried their hardest to make it fair. And now the commission on presidential debates that was created in the 1980s by the heads of the Democratic and Republican parties. And um, and so they get to get to determine who's in the debates, um, the terms of the debates, where they're going to be, what the questions are. So these two parties, you know, they can just take, you know, right now we have Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. They were on our ballots in 2012. They're probably going to be on our ballots again, but they won't be allowed to participate in the debates unless the two Democratic and Republican candidates allow them to be. Now, what's fascinating is that those candidates are outsiders like Trump and Bernie Sanders. They might allow them to be in the debate, but um, but that is one method of controlling that level of the government that I do think the Democratic and Republican parties working together have rigged it in their favor. Wow. Now, when it comes to Congress, which is the people's branch, yes, independents can absolutely win um, because I checked and in all 50 states, there is a method for an independent to get themselves on the general election ballot. Now, in some states, it's extraordinarily difficult. Washington State and California have changed their system to something called the top two primary system, which means you have to win a primary pretty much. You have to be either first or second to be on the general election ballot, which irritates me because it means that they've literally limited the number of choices that we have for Congress on our ballots. And um, as a California resident, I'm going to do everything I can to get that sw system switched. It's really um, before that system was put in place in California, 66 percent of the people on our general election ballots were Democrats or Republicans. After that system was put in place, it's 96 percent. And that's held up over time. So um, they really have rigged it in California wow. and Washington. But that leaves us 48 other states. And in, in some other states, I mean, it's 
unbelievably easy to get on the general election ballot. And that's where I'd love us to focus our attention. I mean, for instance, in Tennessee, all you need to do to get on the ballot is to get 25 registered voters from your district to sign a position to sign a petition and you're in. There's not even a fee. So um, if we were to focus on those states that haven't yet been rigged by the big two parties, yes, independents can get into Congress. And if you have problems with the way the government is run and with, with what is going on in the executive branch, the best strategy we can have is to get independents into Congress because that's where the checks and balances are. We seem to believe that a check on a Republican president or a Democratic president is by electing someone from the other party. That's not what checks and balances are. Checks and balances are the executive branch is checked by the congressional branch. And right now we're ignoring Congress to our peril. Mm. Mm. So w what would you suggest as an ideal election process? I mean, it, should there just be rules on who can, you know, what donations can be accepted? Um, you know, it, should it be taxpayer funded? Uh, that's going to sound like treason on, on this on this platform <laughs> here. But I mean, would that be the only way to to take away the the bias, the special interest, the the different? You know, someone's just a celebrity. I, I I don't even know. Like you know, the the control of the Republicans, the Democrats. I mean, how do you? How do you make it fair and take away just the agendas of Democrats and Republicans? So um, when it comes to the money, I think we're seeing right now that I think the best thing to do is to just make all donations donations public. So you can't hide them through dark money groups. That's really where the trouble is for me. Because if you look at what's happening right now, Bernie Sanders is crushing Hillary Clinton in fundraising. Another thing the media is not talking about. But he's taking small donations from individuals like you and me and crushing her, even though she's been, you know, trying to kiss up to corporations and trying to get the big money for a long, long time. And it was working. Um, but now that the tide is turning. And so you can crowd fund, especially in the age of the internet. And you can get your mess small scale using the internet. YouTube is a thing and it's free and almost everyone has the internet now. So we do have ways to get our message out without the money and without limiting people's money. Um, so, so making it public will then make it public and publicly known that, hey, this company uh, you know, made a donation. So any favors that are done is now known. I mean, how does that solve an issue between, you know, the government and Exxon Mobil, let's say, just because people know about it, is that going to stop, you know, them colluding with one another? Well, I mean, lobbying and campaign finance are two completely different different things. If we're still talking about campaign finance, the reason I would like for all donations to a candidate to be made public is because we could, in our research as voters, look at a candidate and be like, well, this person took $5 million from Wall Street and this person did not. And you could use that information to, to give you a better idea of who this person is and who they're going to owe favors to once they get in office. One of the issues that we have now is something called um, a social welfare organization. Organizations. And it's a way that politicians are funneling secret money to themselves. And so these 501c4 social welfare organizations originally were supposed to be for, you know, educational programs, stuff like that. And they get to keep their donors secret. But a small change in the law made it so that they could do things that are political up to 49% of their business. And so that has just been wildly abused. And so now political groups like, you know, uh, Karl Rove's Crossroads, um, what is it? No, Crossroads is, there's a Crossroads something that's um, Karl Rove's organization. There's Priorities USA, which was Barack Obama's organization. Mm -hmm. These huge political organizations are claiming to be for social welfare and therefore donors to those organizations we don't know who they are, or how much money they're giving, and then that money goes to the candidates. So that's what I mean by dark money. If we can shine a light on the dark money and know really who's giving money to Hillary Clinton, who's really giving money to Cruz and Trump and Sanders, then that's how we can, as voters, say, okay, this person's bought off. I'm not voting for them. This person isn't. I can see their financials. I know where every dime comes from, and I can make better choices. Now, once you're in office, that becomes a whole different issue. But as far as campaign finance is concerned, I don't necessarily think that it's necessary to have public financing. I mean, it would solve a problem. 
but it's not the only solution. Um, sunlight can also do the same exact thing. Mm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, it, it's it's always just how do we make it better? And I, I guess going back to, you know, at the congressional level in, in the states, is it just that some of these other states haven't been taken over yet by the establishment? And are they at risk of being taken over, uh, like you said California was? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because all of this stuff right now is happening at the state level. That's one weird thing about our actual like American system is that we leave decisions about how primaries are going to be run and how elections are going to be run up to the states. And I think that's a big mistake for federal elections. Like, for instance, why do we have Iowa <laughs> as our first state? Mm -hmm. There's like four people in Iowa. And if you don't win Iowa, all these candidates just quit, even though California has 475 delegates and doesn't vote until June. There should be a national primary day. In one day, we get it done, we have the nominees, and we go on with our lives. Instead, we have these ridiculously drawn out elections and it's all because the states determine what date they vote on and what you have is states wanting to have more of a say in the election so they keep moving up their date and so now we have year-long elections where it just it doesn't have to be this way so if we just said okay national office national rules i do think that would help the system tremendously because like i said as far as you know getting on the ballot is concerned for a national office you know, a California representative had a much harder route to the same exact office as someone from Tennessee. And so um, there is some unfairness in that. I mean, North Carolina is an incredibly rigged state. They're the most redistricted. That's Their districts are ridiculously shaped. If you want to see something that's going to make you laugh slash throw up, look at the districts in North Carolina. And they've made it very, very difficult to, for people to get on the ballot there. Yet you just go right over the river and you're in Tennessee and you need 20 five signatures and you're good. That's wrong. Mm. You know, it's the same exact office representing the same exact number of people. The qualifications shouldn't be so all, all over the map. So if I had one suggestion, that would be it. Yeah. One set of rules for national offices. I mean, is there any value, though, getting to know these candidates over time rather than, uh, you know, just voting right away? Because I feel like people are getting to know Trump. They're getting to know Sanders. They're getting to know Hillary to a larger degree. And we are seeing the tide turn in certain aspects as we continue to go along the election cycle. And having just one voting day, don't you think that would kind of take away from the people being able to get to know these candidates? Not necessarily, because I don't think it's the number of days we've voted that's introduced people to these candidates. It's the number of debates. Mm -hmm. So we can still have the same number of debates and have the same amount of you know media obsession as we have now, but have a primary date in June for the entire country. You know, that's possible. It's really a matter of making sure that these candidates are speaking to each other and we get to know who they are. And that brings me back to, you know, rigging the process of these these debates. Um, one thing that I think is a major problem is that we now have cable news organizations running debates. And so they've been deciding who our can candidates are by kicking certain ones out or not allowing them to participate in the first place. Mm. So I do think that we need an overhaul of our debate system because that's how we get to know our candidates. It's not from different election days. Yeah. Well, I, I, I usually watch saturday night live uh, on youtube periodically and you know the comedy central trevor noah just to see what they're saying about you know trump and sanders and hillary clinton and it does have a media bias towards hillary clinton to a very large degree and i can only imagine how much of a pull even comedy central has had over the last 10 20 years on the decision making of the american people because i you know the humor connects with people and there's definitely a bias as to what they are saying so uh jen with that any closing thoughts that you wanted to share here uh for our audience before we uh hung up um, I mean, the only thing that I really hope that people will do is vote because I've heard from far too many people that they're going to sit out because they think it's a corrupt system and they don't want to participate. And that's the exact opposite of what you do if you actually want to fix something. I mean, people who sit out and don't vote are people who are trying to excuse themselves from everything that's wrong in this country. And it turns out they are what's wrong in this country because so many people who are informed and are aware are, are sitting on the sidelines. And we just can't have that anymore, especially for people that are 30 
30 and under. You know, um, here in California in the last election, we had an 8% turnout rate in that age bracket. It's unacceptable. So, I mean, I understand being upset by this system and I understand not liking it, but the only way to change it is to go and vote. All of the money, everything that they're trying to do is to court your vote. And if you don't, if you don't participate, you're not immune from the blame. You are to blame. So just please vote. So, um, and if people wanted to learn more about what you do and it, your regular show, uh, where would they go and what would they find? So the show is called Congressional Dish, and I read bills that go through Congress. I watch a lot of congressional hearings, and I go in depth into, you know, what they're trying to do in our names. I really, I don't cover campaigns. I cover what they're actually doing on the um, in Congress and the legislative side, and I have a lot of fun with it too. I mean, it's not dry and boring, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's called Congressional Dish. And if you listen to podcasts, it's anywhere podcasts can be found, and um, you can always find it through the website too at congressionaldish.com, where I source every thing that I say. So I fact check and you can fact check me too. Mm. Well, Jen, I, I do appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your knowledge with us today. And I look forward to having you on in the near future. Oh, it would be my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.